purposes. And that's an inanity that serves incumbent politics beautifully. Given the way the laws are stacked against third parties, given the way um, the two major parties conspire, and I use that word advisedly, conspire in incumbent protection, carving districts and laying off uh, risks on, on um, not on each other but on the society and you know you wind up with a house of representatives where 90 percent of the members or more don't have a race which is kind of astounding when you think about it but both parties like it like that senate's a bit better but not much better you make your money connections you take care of certain interests you can have this job for life that's what Nader is looking at, and it makes him furious, makes me furious, makes a lot of Americans furious. But it's not easy to say how you break it up. The left is too puny to accomplish something of this in, in a winner-take-all political system. Uh, he won 2.7, 2 and 2.8% of the vote. Turned out it was 2.7%. That's people who don't understand politics, people who think politics is therapy, people who are naive about politics. That's what you can win. You can win 2.7% of the vote. To believe that the mission of politics is to rally your 2.7% is adolescent. That's, that's the effort, that's striving to form a club. That is not striving to affect the course of events in a constructive way. Excuse me, but 2.7% of the vote was the largest progressive vote total in 75 years in the United States of America. Now, there are a lot of people saying they don't want more of the same. That represents millions of people. Everyone who has fought in America to make this country a democracy and to improve it has been considered nutty. The abolitionists were considered absolute fools and idiots and accused of everything Ralph Nader is accused of. The same thing goes through for the founders of this nation. The uh, populace, when they fought against the railroads and the major corporations, they were called all kinds of names. The E.V. Debs and all of those who fought, they were considered lunatics and out of context and so forth, the people who built the labor movement. In fact, the, all American history is the history of people like Ralph Nader in different contexts trying to improve and change the circumstances. All change really starts with a few people around a kitchen table, in a small committee, uh, getting together upset with some injustice or another, saying we are not going to tolerate uh, this anymore. Every major progressive law in the United States, whether it's the right of women to vote, Social Security, the rights of the Labor Party, never any of these proposals came out of the two major parties. They always came from the grassroots, from the people, and there were people who led those struggles, who were independent, not functioning as agents of these two parties, who were always called names and suffered personal abuse the way Ralph Nader is suffering today. Third parties, uh, unless they have hallucinations, don't expect to win. Uh, but what they expect to do is to have an effect on whoever does win. Uh, what, the, what they expect to do is to, to hold up a standard uh, to raise the issues, to put those issues in the consciousness of people. Which after a while the third party has to be absorbed in its ideas taken by one of the two parties and that's a way to strengthen and renew the system. That's the function of third parties in a rigged two-party system, that they were not going to win, uh, they were going to have a hard time getting on the ballot, but they were throwing that agenda of humanity at the parties, and over time, uh, our history has shown that one of the parties picks it up. The better they do, the more likely it is that one of the major parties wants to come in and steal that thunder. Back in the in late 19th century, the Populist Party raised issues uh, which then bec actually became part of the program of the New Deal. Uh, and, and, and the uh, Socialist Party did the same. Norman Thomas was willing to run for president five times, especially during the Franklin Delano Roosevelt years. And he said, my greatest achievement is how many of my issues were stolen by the Democratic Party. And that's how he saw his role. And of course, his party proposed Social Security earlier than the Democrats, unemployment compensation, health and safety regulation, minimum wage. He had a say in setting the agenda.
And I think that Ralph sees that somehow as more important than getting yourself elected to a particular office. I'm not surprised that other people would consider Ralph Nader uh, sort of following the path of Norman Thomas in creating an independent uh, political candidacy. That history doesn't work for me. i tell you why, because uh, Norman Thomas was running for uh, president on the socialist ticket in the 20s and 30s. Um, following a, a, a real political party called the Socialists that existed 20 years before Thomas and, and peaked in 1912 and was stayed around but uh, and still and still had influence in lots of institutions of politics and government but it, it doesn't fit Nader's history I mean he didn't have that behind him well that's true factually true that doesn't mean the functions can't be comparable between Nor what Norman Thomas's impact on the two parties and what we were trying to do with the two parties. The difference is it was a more fluid situation in the tumultuous 30s. Uh, and uh, it's a more rigid, ossified, exclusionary two-party duopoly today. So that, that, I think that's a, a more important factual difference.